Welcome to Climbing Mount St. Helens, a Cascade Classic. This is Mount St. Helens Institute. Mount St. Helens, or Lawit Latla, or the anglicized pronunciation Luwit, is a striking volcano in the Cascade Range of Washington State, a perfect place for experienced hikers and beginner mountaineers to climb to the top of this 8,363 foot peak. Today, I'll cover the relationship between Mount St. Helens Institute, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, permitting on the mountain, and what to expect from a climb of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens Institute exists to advance understanding and stewardship of the earth through science, education, and exploration of volcanic landscapes. We are a nonprofit partner to the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument and have been in operation since 1996. Mount St. Helens Institute operates under a special use permit provided by the monument. The U.S. Forest Service manages the land and the permitting of the area, and the Institute covers education and guiding on the volcano. We overlap by serving the mountain and its recreationists, and the Institute provides volunteers for land stewardship, trail maintenance, scientific research, and to assist hikers and climbers on the trails. We are proud to also work in partnership with the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, on whose traditional land we operate. The Cowlitz Tribe has seats on our Board of Directors, and we offer joint programming to both tribal youth and the general public. It is important to note that the land on which we operate was never ceded by treaty, never purchased by the U.S. government, and never won by any sort of challenge. In September of 2013, after a multi-year process, Mount St. Helens was listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its significance as a traditional cultural property of the Cowlitz Indian tribe to the west and the Confederated tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation to the east. It is listed in the registry as it is known by the tribal groups, Lawet Lakla, which translates to the smoker because of its long geologic history of it intermittent volcanic eruptions. The Cowlitz tribe consists of 4,100 people, mostly located in the Seattle and Portland areas. As you can see by the official seal and emblem of the Cowlitz Indian tribe in the top right, Mount St. Helens appears for its significance to their culture and continued story of the region. Mount St. Helens is a spectacular piece of history. Most notable for its eruption on May 18th of 1980, the effects have been lasting on the surrounding communities and on the study of volcanoes worldwide. It lost 1,000 feet of elevation and 2.5 cubic kilometers, or 0.6 cubic miles, in the blast, and now stands 8,363 feet above sea level. Climbing to the summit rim is not only a climbing accomplishment, it is participating in a chapter of volcanic history. The reason for a permit system is, and always has been, to protect natural and cultural resources and special biological communities within the closure area, as well as public safety. Permits help the Forest Service manage climbing opportunities for the benefit of the public. To speak briefly on the history of climbing permits at Mount St. Helens, climbing permits were able to be picked up in person at Jack's Corner at the corner of 503 and 503 which burned down in 2007. Climbers then picked up in person at the Lone Fir Resort in Cougar, Washington until 2014. As Mount St. Helens became more popular, the permitting system moved electronic, and Mount St. Helens Institute started issuing permits in 2010 until 2018. In 2019, the Forest Service transitioned to permitting using recreation.gov. Offering permits through recreation.gov offers climbers increased flexibility, including the ability to change group members' names, adding members to your group permit, and having the option to refund unused spots up to two weeks before your climb. Restrictions of course apply, and I'll be going over those in the upcoming slides. Permitting at Mount St. Helens is divided into three quota seasons. The first, between April 1st and May 14th is limited to 500 climbers a day, and the permits must be purchased online in advance. 
between May 15th and October 31st, permitting is limited to 100 climbers per day. Again, permits must be purchased online in advance. The reason for the drop of climbers from 500 to 100 a day is to protect the trail and the ecological habitat of Mount St. Helens once the snow melts and the habitat becomes more fragile to human interference. From November 1st through May 31st, there is no limit to the number of climbers per day and the permit is free and self-issue at the trailhead by signing into the climbers register. Here are a few things to know before getting started. Permits are issued as one per group, not one per individual. Groups can be anywhere from one to 12 people. Permits cost $15 per climber with a one-time non-refundable reservation fee of $6 per transaction. The person who purchases the climbing permits is called the permit holder. This person must be included in the climbing group and the name cannot be changed at any time without full cancellation of the permit. So how do I prepare before the sale on March 18th? First, determine your preferred dates to climb. Make a list of all your group members' legal names. The reason for this is the climbers may be asked to provide their government-issued ID by rangers on the climbing route, which could result in a fine if the names do not match. Designate a permit holder to purchase the permit, and then designate an emergency contact for your group. Permits go fast. In 2019, when permits went on sale at 7 a.m., every weekend day was sold out by 7.07. Here are some tips we've learned in previous years to give you the best shot at obtaining a climbing permit. Use the fastest internet connection available to you. Update your browser. Chrome and Firefox work best. And create a recreation.gov account before the sale or double check your password if you already have an account. Simply go to recreation.gov at any time to create an account if you don't have one already. From there, you can search for Mount St. Helens climbing permits. If you are searching before the sale date, you will see an alert bar that Mount St. Helens climbing permits are not yet available, but you can still review all of this information and more on the website recreation.gov. A link will become active on this page at the time of sale. When you log in at the time of sale, you'll be able to choose your desired date from the calendar on the right. Enter the number of climbers in your group, select a date on the calendar with permits available, and if available, your permits are now removed from the calendar and held in your cart while you finish checking out. A red timer box will appear in the top right corner, counting down 15 minutes to complete your transaction. When ordering, the purchaser will complete their information as well as each of their group members' names. Their own name will autofill the first slot as the permit holder. The total cost will be in the upper right-hand corner. You will also have to enter an emergency contact info before completing your order. Once purchased, you will receive a confirmation email. To make changes, cancellations, or to print your permit, you will have to log back in to recreation.gov. Under My Account in the upper right-hand corner, you will have the option to view My Reservations to make those changes or print the permit. The best thing about permitting via recreation.gov is the flexibility. We all know that life has a tendency to throw us for a loop when we least expect it. So what if you need to make changes to your permit? This slide will show an infographic outlining the important dates to remember when making changes to your permit. Our timeline is from the date of purchase all the way to the date of your climb. If you want to change your group members' names, you can do so up to seven days before your climb. Within seven days of your climb, these names cannot be changed. 
If you want to change your group size, you may add people to your permit up to two days before your climb, if permits are available. You may only drop group members from your permit up to seven days before your climb. If you want to cancel your permit entirely, you may do so at any time. However, a refund of $15 per person is only available if the permit is canceled with more than 14 days notice before your climb. In addition to a refund, these permits become available for resale to other eager climbers. If you cancel between 14 and seven days of your climb, a refund is not available to you, but your permits may still become available to other, for other climbers to purchase. If canceled with less than seven days notice, there is no refund and the permits cannot be available to others. If you have made all possible changes to your permit, you are ready to print. It's important to note that your permit will only be available to print from your recreation.gov account only within two weeks of your climb and may only be printed or downloaded once. After it is printed or downloaded, no changes can be made. What if you didn't get a climbing permit? Hang in there. Returned permits are resold on recreation.gov within 24 hours, so keep checking. How do I prepare for the climb? Whether you climb the summer route out of Climbers Bivouac or the winter route out of Marble Mountain Snow Park depends largely on what time of year you will climb. Marble Mountain Snow Park is open year round, but is two miles longer and 1,000 feet more of elevation gain. The gravel road to Climbers Bivouac is not plowed in the winter, and since it rests higher on the slope, is inaccessible when there is snow below 3,800 feet. Next, we'll take a virtual tour of these two routes. In winter and spring, or when the snow has closed the road 81 that leads to Climbers Bivouac, you will be climbing the Worm Flows route out of Marble Mountain Snow Park. This route is 12 miles round trip and 5,530 feet of elevation gain. Expect 8 to 12 hours to make it to the summit. This is Marble Mountain Snow Park. You will need a Washington State Snow Park Pass to park here between November and April or as posted available only by advanced purchase. After April, there is no fee to park here. Oregon snow park passes are not accepted. There is dispersed camping available on a first come first served basis. There are pit toilets, but no running water nor trash service. The first two miles of the climb is through the trees until you get to Chocolate Falls a 40-foot drop that runs brown with volcanic ash in the summer and is frozen in the winter. You will continue up the Worm Flows Ridge until you hit the seismic station at 6,200 feet. Many people use this as a waypost to then make informed decisions about continuing up to the summit if conditions are questionable. The biggest avalanche risk for climbers exists above this section. It is important to always monitor the conditions as you ascend. If you see evidence of avalanche slides, it may not be safe to continue to the summit. Another danger is cornices. Cornices occur on the summit or in gullies whenever there is an accumulation of snow, regardless of the season or the route climbed. These fragile features may break up to 60 feet back from the edge and cascade into the crater in an avalanche, posing enormous risk to climbers. Please stay far back away from the ledge, but don't worry, you'll still have access to plenty of views. The summit is 8,363 feet high, though once your route reaches the rim, you'll need to hike another quarter mile west to reach the true summit. When the road is clear of snow, Typically in June or early July, you will be climbing the Monitor Ridge route out of Climbers Bivouac. This trail is 10 miles round trip, 
with 4,630 feet of elevation gain. Even if the road to Climber's Bivouac is open, you may still be hiking in snow. The climb starts at Climber's Bivouac, which has established campsites with tent platforms, fire rings, pit toilets, and trash service. There is no running water, so please plan accordingly. A Northwest Forest Pass or America the Beautiful Interagency Pass is required to park and camp here. Day passes are available at the trailhead by cash or check. After two miles through the trees, you will reach the boulder field. This will be what most of your climb looks like. You will pass Monitor Peak, shown on the right, at 5,994 feet and reach a small bench at 6,000 feet before the boulder field gets to its steepest section. You will reach the GPS station at 7,000 feet. From this station, you will continue to ascend a ridge of boulders until the final stretch. Just above this station, the winter route meets up with the ridge to take you to the summit. The last thousand feet of the summer route is affectionately called the vertical beach. Expect two steps up and one step back on your ascent from here. But you're almost there. You might even see some friends greet you at the summit. And then you've made it. Clear days will reveal views of the crater, Rainier, Adams, Hood, Goat Rocks, Jefferson, and even as far as the Three Sisters. But remember, the true summit is still a quarter mile west. So what do I need for the day of the climb? You will need your permit, printed and digital copies shared with each member of your group. After you've downloaded your permit, when you only get one chance to do so, print off extra copies or take screenshots to share with your group members. You will also need a government-issued ID that matches the name on your permit. You'll need the 10 essential system, navigation, headlamp, sun protection, first aid, repair kit and tools, fire kit, shelter, extra food, water between three and four liters, and extra layers. Depending on the season, you may need an ice axe, snowshoes, crampons, or micro spikes. And as with any backcountry trip, have an emergency plan. Leave your itinerary with someone off the mountain and be sure to check in with them when you're done. All of this information is available on our website, mshinstitute.org. Head to the Explore tab, and there you can find route descriptions, sample packing lists, and recommendations on how to prepare for your climb. Want more out of your climb? Join us on a guided trip. Mount St. Helens Institute offers lots of programs, including day hikes, trips into the crater, and of course, summit climbs. Some of our trips are accompanied by geologists and other scientists to give you a deeper understanding and context for the cultural and natural history of Mount St. Helens. Some trips we are offering in 2020 include a winter overnight and summit climb on March 14th and 15th, where you will learn snow camping skills at Chocolate Falls and learn how to climb in snow with a summit attempt on Sunday. Also coming up is our Wilderness First Aid course, co-hosted by Knowles. This invaluable course will teach you how to be prepared for an emergency in the backcountry or any time you are far from medical care. This weekend course is held at our stunning Science and Learning Center on the north side of Mount St. Helens and includes all meals and lodging, as well as a Wilderness First Aid certification that is good for two years. This year, we have the special opportunity to partner with Cough Adventures for a ski and splitboard summit climb on April 11th. This epic trip will take you on black diamond level backcountry terrain and allow you to ski off the summit. Our most popular trips are summit climbs. 
Mount St. Helens Institute offers classic summit climbs, sunrise summits, where you hike at midnight to reach the summit at sunrise, and summits with a geologist, where the group is accompanied by a professional geologist to go in depth about the features you see around you. Our Into the Crater hike remains one of our most magnificent trips. These trips stay at our remote field camp near Windy Ridge on the east side of Mount St. Helens, with canvas wall tents, wood stoves, an outdoor kitchen, and a composting toilet to make all your glamping dreams come true. The hike is approximately nine miles with 2,500 feet of elevation gain and takes you right up to the terminus of one of the fastest growing glaciers in the world. This route is not available to the public and is only accessible through our special use permit with the Forest Service. In 2019, Mount St. Helens Institute even had the pleasure of accompanying Bill Nye into the crater. Bill Nye is one of our longest standing board members. In 2020, you will have two chances to see him live, hosted by the Cowlitz Indian Tribe. He will be in Portland on March 15th and in Seattle on March 16th. Our Glacier Overlook hike is a staff favorite, hiking eight miles up towards the Crater Glacier with a visit to Lewitt Falls and ending at sweeping vistas of the mouth of the crater. Foraging has long-standing importance at Mount St. Helens, and we are pleased to offer berry foraging with the Kellett's tribe in August, as well as opportunities to mushroom forage alongside a mushroom specialist in September and October. Does this all sound like a dream? We are hiring. Positions are open for lead guides, assistant guides, and a field camp host. Applications close March 17th. Find more information under About Us on our website. Mount St. Helens Institute has lots of volunteer opportunities, from staffing visitor centers, to roving the trails helping hikers and climbers, to assisting unguided programs. We are a small organization of eight full-time employees and over 350 dedicated volunteers. Our mountain stewards are those who accompany all of our guided programs or rove on the trails to assist hikers and climbers. They receive an annual climbing permit to climb Mount St. Helens anytime they wish, as well as the opportunity to gain two admin permits per season to have friends or family join you on a climb. Orientations occur in May and you can apply at any time. Find out more by visiting our website, mshinstitute.org. Permits go on sale March 18th at 7 a.m. Pacific time. See you on the volcano.